Well, honestly, thank you so much, guys. It really is a great pleasure to be here. And yeah, like she said, feel free to ask as whatever questions you like. There's no such thing as a silly question. Actually, last week I was speaking at a school and primary school, one of the children asked me if I was his father. So it's like... <laughs> it was, <laughs> the answer was no. But, then, but it was like, it's, yeah, feel free to ask whatever. But first of all, thank you so much for everyone who's put this event on together. I really, really appreciate it. I think one of the reasons I actually wanted to come down was just because at the time, like, it's only like, I only ever knew Sheffield Green Party and I thought, well, there's so many other amazing group party members doing so much around the country. It'd be great to just say hi, basically. But also, as well as just talk about some stuff that I've read, but also just for myself, just to learn a lot and just, and also just to give back more than anything to a big Green Party family around the country that I feel has given me so much. So thank you so much to everyone for putting this time together. <clears throat> so to talk about myself, and um, first of all, I should start off by talking about my mother. And as frustrating as she can be with her constant <laughs> nagging of why I'm still not married, my mother is probably the most courageous person that I know. When she's not being overly ambitious, trying to grow exotic fruits like avocado and guava, she basically runs a very small um, charity, which is an orphan charity to help orphans back in her village in Somalia. All the while while living with rheumatoid arthritis and frimbolgi and other kind of illnesses, which at times give her a lot of intolerable pain. Many people may have walked past her in the street and they would not even notice her. The racists and the Islamophobes would probably have the worst things to say about her, and yet they don't even know her. Through her sacrifices and endeavours, from leaving Somalia with nothing but courage, hope, and selfless determination, uh, she has provided me and my sister with so much that we're really, really thankful for. She really knew the value of opportunity, and where to take that when it came her way. She has always had to deal with a multi multitude of personal struggles, and even had to put up with a lot of the issues as a teenager, my kid would also put her through as well. But she has never ever lost any faith in me, and she really didn't ever give up on me either. She made the brave decision to leave Somalia in 1994. The devastating and ongoing civil war, internal conflict still looks bleak and unresolvable. And back then there was even greater uncertainty and precariousness. So one day, a day that I can't remember, and one uh, that she doesn't really talk about much, we decided to basically leave. And despite what you hear through the media and the tabloids, honestly, like, no one really chooses to leave their home, their family, their friends, unless it was a necessity, basically. And after around eight months in living in Ethiopia, waiting to see where on earth we were going to end up, um, we literally could have ended up anywhere, and we ended up in the city of Sheffield. And for those that don't know, Sheffield is also the first city of sanctuary in the UK, but meaning it was the first refugee settlement places in the UK, and it's got a very long, rich history of welcoming people from all across the world. And I reckon, like, I think the first day we actually came to Sheffield, I vaguely remember it was a rainy day. And it really didn't take long to realise that was a default setting for this part of the world. <laughs> but it was, nonetheless, it was actually a really quite exciting feeling like a new adventure more than anything. And of course, none of us could speak English at the time. But English wasn't crucial or as much as a barrier when it term, in terms of playing Kirby and playing other like, sports and playing with the children in the community that I kind of grew up. However, for my mother, who... I guess it's always a lot more difficult when you're an adult coming to a new country, having to learn English, as well as of her, of course, going to college and trying. It was still difficult. And me and my sister would take on extra responsibilities. I assume that the children our age wouldn't have to do, like translating, filling out forms, etc. But it really did kind of feel more of like a team effort more than anything. So it wasn't, it didn't, at the time, didn't feel much of a chore. But now, Thankfully, she can speak English and swear in English and do everything. <laughs> but um, growing up, um, um, yeah, so growing up, we basically grew up in a part of Sheffield, um, which was a lot of people say was socially deprived part of um, Sheffield, North Sheffield. And growing up, they had like, people always ask me, well, who are your role models growing up? And the only people that kind of come to my mind straight away is because I had two posters on my bedroom wall. One of them was of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and then the other one was of uh, The Rock, the wrestler. 
And my mum really didn't understand the Western culture of having pictures of people you didn't know on your wall. Especially one with a lady holding a dagger and a guy in his underwear raising his eyebrow. So um, she, uh, many times she would walk past and just question my sanity. But um, yeah, it's, it, it was definitely uh, interesting. But I would I'll say you know, on a more kind of different, I would say like going on the internet, I would say, I was before who was your role model, I'd say the internet was my role model in the sense of because it was offered so much, not only was it a space that my mother didn't know anything about, but it was like honestly offered like, taught me so much, we just showed me so much more to the world than what I actually knew and experienced and I would of course learn new things on there, I would, yeah it literally kind of just was an amazing tool to have growing up which I would use to escape and lots of um, different things. But onto the present moment, um, as I'm sure a lot of people know, our system is well and truly broken. You just have to look around you to see that we've got rising inequality, rising poverty, failing public services, and yet more distrust for policy makers and decision makers than ever before. Donald Trump, the racist, misogynist, waste man, is somehow still president. The far right and more emboldened and barbaric by the day parade streets throughout the UK and Europe, breathing in discontent and exhaling bigotry and fostering hatred within our communities. We've got immoral arms dealing, sinister geopolitics and tyranny fuel, bloody wars in conflicts in Syria, Yemen, Ukraine, Mali, Kashmir and elsewhere that continue to spell devastation, death and displacement for many people. And our world best scientists have told us we have only got 12 years, 12 very short years, to prevent exponential acceleration of catastrophic climate and disaster. And it really is as simple as action or extinction. So there's a lot we're doing in Sheffield, I'm sure there's a lot of people around the whole country that are trying to bring that to the forefront of things as well. And of course then there's Brexit. We have a brainless government that has been that has bent over backwards, trying to gratify a handful of fanatics, caught in the chaos between Theresa's turmoil and Boris's buffoonery. Both who should be charged with negligence towards the people of this country. And inspired by the simple philosophy of doing things differently, I have attempted to use my platform to celebrate Sheffield and draw awareness to important causes and to try and bring people together in a world that I feel is trying to constantly drive us apart. Yes, I do and have ruffled the right feathers. And yes, I do ask difficult questions and remind the sleepy establishment of the radical and disruptive power of the Green Party for positive change. And I've been clear all along, we must continue to question tradition and dangerous policies. The reception that I received during my term in office, whether that be on social media, walking through the streets of Sheffield, visiting schools, businesses, or attending events around the country and different parts of Europe has honestly been quite overwhelming, positively overwhelming and really empowering. The status quo, I feel, has left the majority of people tired, in disrepair and wanting of something new. The truth is the political establishment are not representative of our society. They are out of ideas, out of touch and quite frankly out of time. Poor representation in politics breeds mistrust and lack of respect. Conversely, diverse representation in politics builds tolerance and understanding. And if I've been honest with you, one of the reasons I feel as if I have gathered a lot of attention somewhat during my uh, time as Lord Mayor has been, I think if we look at all forms of government, that be local or national, the people that we have as our leaders don't reflect the people that are there to represent. So even if we look at our government cabinet, for example, who are majority of them quite well off come from a certain different demographic, how on earth are they really meant to understand what child poverty is or have a real understanding of the devastating effects of austerity? And I think that's why it really, really is important to get more people from the LGBT plus Q uh, plus community, people from BME backgrounds, more women, just so we feel as if like, we have got more representatives that reflect the country that we live in at the moment and which will hopefully then lead to a more fairer society. My first actual experience of campaigning started when I was at university. And for me, I just always really wanted to go to university because I knew the opportunities that university kind of brought and was going to give me. And at the time of when I was having to decide what I wanted to study at university, I was fortunate if I did six months of... Sorry, just get that burp out of the way. <laughs> but, um, so I, I was fortunate if I did six months of working in like 
factories and jungle. It was just to save some money. I did six months of travelling. And it was during the time of UCAS and having to decide what I wanted to study. And I just remember going through like the courses that you can study, like A, accounting. I was like, no, I'm not interested in accounting. B, business. And long story short, I ended up studying aquatic zoology at the University of Hull. And you know, honestly, like it's, I never really, uh, it was never an ambition of mine to pursue a career, a career in marine biology or conservation, and that I was interested in that at the time. I guess it was just wanted to go to university for the experience of it. And um, yeah, one of the reasons, so when I was at university, um, I really was involved in my sports club. And for those people that ask me, well, where does magic magic come from? So like, which is like my Twitter handle and stuff. So I used to do a lot of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is a lot of submission grappling. It's a sport. And so my fight name was Magic Magic the Submission Magician, which um, I was given to by my peers. And basically I was part of this MMA mixed martial arts sports club. And at the time we had really poor sports facilities at university. And then that's what led me want to want to campaign for better sports provision and work on another sports club and then getting more involved in my students' union. And then when I was in part of my students' union and then friends would really so I imagine you thought of running for your student union president and just have you ever thought of that? And it's something I actually never thought of because even looking at the ten previous people that held that position, they were politics students and all from similar so I kinda of actually thought it wasn't something for me. And when I decided to throw myself into it, it was a bit of a whirlwind because it I knew I cared about issues, so I knew I was going to stand up for like wanting to eradicate the hidden course costs of university fees. I knew I wanted to uh, sign up for free education, better sports provision, but even at that time at the university, I didn't know the difference between left and right, politically speaking, and I knew the core issues I wanted to campaign on. I even remember the hustings being asked if I was going to join the picket line, and just thinking, what on earth is a picket line? And I just completely gambled and I said yes. And I just got <laughs> <laughs> Well, but like, I, I really, politics wasn't a thing, but um, it was only once I finished university and then I um, got involved um, with my local council and whatnot, kind of just things basically. So, and one of the reasons I wanted to stand as a councillor was that, first of all, I was actually just tired of complaining and I would look at Sheffield and whatnot, and I just, and there's only so much in the sense that I just couldn't keep on asking the wrong people to do the right thing. And I think with so much, this is during 2014, during the rise of UKIP and in the European election, finally. And there was just so much rhetoric of fear, hate, and division that was happening. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, there's so much fun in the world happening. If I can at least make my small part of the world within that Sheffield and my community and people's lives, that'd be better. That's at least me contributing and having some sort of positive impact when all this negativity is basically happening around. And it was generally with that kind of compassion at the heart of what I was thinking at the time that led, led me to want to get politically active. And my friends always ask me, well, why did you join the Greens and why not any other political party? So in Sheffield, Sheffield is one of the socialist republic of uh, South Yorkshire. It's a very red uh, city. And I would ask, naturally, you go and ask the people that you're closest to, your friends and your family, and they were all majority, like most of them. In fact, all of them were Labour Party supporters of voters. And I would ask them, well, why are you, like, why, what excites you about Labour? Why do you vote Labour? And they would always give me the same answer, like, along the lines of, well, we know we're not blue, we're not conservatives, and we just naturally vote Labour. And it felt as if, like, it was a football team that they supported. So like, win or lose, it was like, this is who they were, fundamentally. And I, of course, that didn't sit well with me naturally. Of course, I would do the online test to figure out where you're... <laughs> Sorry. You find out where you're weighing politically aligned. And that was a Green Party. And I would literally, like... Think fundamentally, the Green Party really stuck out to me massively in the sense of, well, the Green Party had a red line against austerity. You knew what you were getting with the Green Party. They stood for free education, wanted to keep our NHS free, and it was... I think with everything else that was happening politically, the Green Party really just gave me a big sense of hope more than anything. It kind of told me that the Green Party weren't trying to play the game, but they were trying to change the game more than anything. And it was kind of like filled with a big sense of pride. But also even when it came to how the political... I know I'm, I know I'm preaching to the convert but like... It was like, like things that really mattered to me at the time was that like, I felt like I had more of a voice in the sense of like... It was great to hear the fact that the Green Party policies made by its members that we can go to conference and it's from the members bottom up driven up. Whereas you look at other political parties, it's always been like a top down approach. That's why 
I guess you'll have Tony Blair and Jeremy Corbyn within the same political party. But for that to really happen, the fund like fundamentally the entire membership of the Green Party would have to change. So and of course then there was no way which meant I felt I could re really represent my party. So for some of the reason that kind of basically led me to join the Green Party. And during like whether that be my year in office, especially during my time as Lord Mayor, again and again I always literally as I was in these words I'd get told, do you know what Maggie, maybe you should you know like you should tone it down, maybe you shouldn't be too political or maybe you shouldn't speak on that issue but like I haven't got that privilege of not being political. I don't think anybody has to be honest. I'm a, specifically I'm a black Muslim refugee immigrant in this country, and especially with a lot of stuff that's happening around this country. I would be such a disservice for me not to use my platform to actually speak out against certain injustices. So as much as people have turned it down, and you know, like there's so much happening, whether it is directly affecting us or not, like. Even by choosing not to say or stand for something or choosing not to speak on something is a form of being political because you've actively made that decision not to speak out against that. So is that saying like staying silent is basically silent with the oppressor and as much stick as I get for being outspoken and whatnot, it's something I definitely will um, continue to do. So whether you're basically directed or not, it's basically important that we all kind of use our platform. And it's all really nice and well with me standing before you here today. And as Lord Mayor of Sheffield, but I'd be lying if I said it was all achieved through hard work alone. As we know, hard work doesn't get you far enough. Of course, it needs to be hard work, but it also needs to be a sacrifice and opportunity. And that's why me being Lord Mayor is as much of a success about so many other people as it is about me, whether that be my mother who made sacrifices, friends who grounded me, people of Sheffield that elected me as a council, but also to the Green Party members, not just in Sheffield, but across the country that have, I feel like have always given me the unwavering support, no matter what it's been on. And it really is important, like, what I feel anyway, whenever, like, I hold whatever platform, where I just really just open the door and support other people to coming up. So, I was the only uh, Green Councillor in my ward in Broomhill and Charlevoix in 2016, and 2017, I made it my sole duty to make sure we get another Green Party and um, councillor elected. And we got a lady called uh, Kaltum, who's a refugee mother of four, elected into, uh, which was a gain from Labour, and that's been amazing. She's been doing really, really well since. And it's just basically, it's just important that, I felt like it'd be so selfish of me to be like, not using my platform to help support other people coming up. And I guess, as Lord Mayor, I've always really pushed myself to unashamedly speak out against injustices, standing against racism, hate and intolerance, defending the most powerless and disenfranchised sections of our society. And I do think where every month I focus on a different campaign, whether that be banning Donald Trump, whether that be uh, while the government rolls out the red carpet, challenging Boris Johnson's overlooked bigotry, demanding all group justice from Sajid Javid, appointing Sheffield's first poet laureate, launching a UK-wide suicide prevention charter and getting over 100 organisations across the country to sign up to them, defending migrants, calling out action against climate change and making the case for anti-war governments. And I've always been someone who really wears their heart on their sleeve. And you would have always, like, I'm sure some of you might have seen me squatting all the time. But, like, I guess, like, it's, it's I guess some people say, well, maybe it's going to become my, like, is it pizza, is it your version of the Tory power? stance or whatnot, but I guess it becomes some form of like symbol of defiance and I think it's up to us for all to create our own traditions and not to conform to standards created by others for themselves or those they wish to maintain power over basically. And every single one of us has a circle, some form of a platform, some degree of influence and speaking truth to power, acting according to our capability and opportunity, whatever that may be is our collective responsibility. And within the fight for a better world, a world with greater equality and tolerance, there is a niche for every one of us to help make that a reality. However, it really isn't all roses and it definitely isn't and hasn't been easy. I actually keep a hate box uh, and a positive box in my parlour, although like, the positive box massively outweighs the hate box. But it, it is, I guess, filled with a lot of like, dozens of like, abusive, whether that be emails, letters, and I guess the social media of bullying culture leaves many of us activists at times quite knackered and exhausted. And to give you an example, I'll share with you just a letter that was sent to me not so long ago. A letter that resembles what I feel the nature of the countless messages 
that um, a lot of people receive from whether it be on social media and it's a terrible reminder of the scores of similar experiences and it reads um, it's quite a strong it reads Majid the monkey you are ruining our country and I wish you would leave you are an n-word your eight parents are n-words F you eat s and die hashtag Joe Cox and I think it was just that latter part that really shocked me more than anything because I'm quite used to like the rest of my kind of views but the last part was really really quite shocking and from North America to Europe the far right really aren't on their way they aren't on their way as a consequence of the crisis of that we have capitalism passive and complicit politicians and the normalization at the hands of the establishment media they are very much here the horrific terrorist attack that we've seen in New Zealand is the epitome of the prolonged and willfully sinister behaviour of the ruling class. Not only am I still shocked and saddened by what happened at Christchurch, but I'm absolutely outraged seeing certain sections of the fear-mongering scapegoat in right-wing media and politicians saying thoughts and prayers when they're very much part to playing for their using of rhetoric that emboldens and normalises Islamophobia and supports white supremacists. And let's, of course, pray for the families and the victims and the communities affected by that. And I'm basically just coming to the end. And the past couple of years, without me as an activist or as a Green Party member, it really has taught me there is always hope, always, always hope, even in the most obscure of places. And it has always taught me three key valuable lessons that I just want to basically share with you guys. So the first lesson that I've learned is courage is contagious. Don't ever underestimate the impact that you can have on others. As every time you take a stand, every time you choose to challenge the status quo, and every time that you decide to take yourself out of your comfort zone and do things differently, not only does that hope take a life of its own, but I promise you, you will excite all those people around you to the point where they will also take a stand and make a difference. The second lesson I've learned is cake is a coping mechanism. Listen, we all need our coping mechanisms to see the hope and to stop us from going numb at times. For me, that mechanism is eating cake. Any form of cake or pudding will do. My favourite being a steaming hot flapjack and custard, or a sweet sticky toffee pudding also with custard. Preferably a lot of custard. <laughs> and um, I guess my recent visit to the dentist showed me isn't without its consequence. Basically. And the third lesson I've learned is compassion, compassion, compassion. Compassion must literally be at the heart and centre of everything that we do. Yes, we are living through some very polarising, difficult times, which requires us to be strong, to be understanding, to work collaboratively, and most of all, to show compassion, as compassion is the ultimate manifestation of strength. Change for the better is not only possible, but it is probable. When we come together for the sake of our common prosperity, with conviction in our beliefs and committed action, with unity, strength, and compassion, we can and we will build that world that truly works for everyone. So remember to do things differently, take a bold stand, and to make your own creative traditions. In that, you'll find me by your side. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.